Hello there. Uh, welcome to the next installment. <laughs> I'm not sure how many this how many installments this actually is of the Writer Studio chat series. Uh, this is a virtual continuation of and supplement to the award-winning nationally syndicated uh, Writer Studio series that's produced by the Writers Garrett here in Dallas, Texas. Um, if you want to learn more about the Writers Studio. You can do so by visiting the Writers Garrett website, writersgarrett.org, www.writersgarrett.org slash writers studio. We'll also supply a link uh, in the event description because um, there's a lot more to learn about this series. Uh, my name is Joe Malazzo. I'm currently the writer in residence at the Writers Garrett. And today we're going to be chatting for the next 30 minutes or so with Will Evans. Will is the Founder, publisher, and executive director of Deep Vellum Publishing, a not-for-profit publishing house based here in Dallas, whose mission is to publish the highest quality works of world literature in English translation and to promote translation as a vital part of our literary culture. Uh, you can read more about Will and his background uh, in the event description, and we'll probably cover some of that today. Uh, but welcome, Will. Glad you could join us. For Thanks this for having me, Joe. Oh, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure uh, to continue the relationship that's begun with the Writers Garrett, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about today as well. Yes. Um, but uh, it's a little bit unusual to have a, a publisher join us for one of these talks. Typically, the Writers Studio focuses on conversations with authors and discussions of craft and things of that nature. Um, but because you're a publisher, uh, I thought I'd start the conversation by asking. Uh, at what point, or how is it that you decided or figured out for yourself that publishing was the way in which you wanted to fulfill the literary aspirations that you have? Uh, well, first off, thank you for having me. It's a real honor. I love the writers Garrett, and it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to get to talk about this today. Um, but as for how I got into publishing and my connection to liter my literary aspirations, I got into publishing through translation, which, uh, which is maybe a little different than most, but uh, it's known less literary. And I found the Deep Vellum kind of with the idea that translators could have more of their works published, hopefully giving a channel to translators. So um, more than, you know, I've never been a writer per se, not since college, but uh, I, I really enjoy literary translation. And it was in graduate school that I had a professor who kind of inspired me to try my hand at translation. And I was like, oh, I can't translate. You know, translators are these gurus who sit on the mountain and they know so many languages and they can live in all these different languages at once. And I'm just a guy who's learning Russian. She said, if you, if you really want to learn Russian, there's no better way than to, than to try translation. And if you want to see this book that you're asking me about in English, the only way it's ever going to happen is if you translate it. But she kind of inspired me to go down that path and get into translation. And it was getting into translation that I learned that, well, not only was contemporary Russian literature underrepresented in the world, it's uh, in English translation, it's also Spanish language literatures, French, German, Chinese, Korean, all the languages of the world. And then there's a real problem with the, you know, the amount of translated literature we read in America. So I... I uh, decided to do something about that and started Deep Vellum as a way to get translators' work out there in front of readers and then to get readers reading more translations and then also to get more people translating and starting to talk and think about translation. So it's a real pleasure to do this here in Dallas. Yeah, so it sounds like translation as a kind of art form is something that you're primarily interested in. Is that absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And... Uh, and they are often invisible artists for us. I know you and I, just in personal conversation, have talked about this. Uh, you might tell the anecdote that you shared with me about the recent translation of um, Kafka's Metamorphosis. Oh, yeah. And what's, what, what that represents in terms of um, helping readers understand the role of the translator. Right. Um, so yeah, there's a you know there's been talk forever about whether translators deserve credit and how much on books, or whether you should just read these foreign books as um, as if they were just magically transported from French or German into English. 
And so um, there's even some great books about that, about like translators and visibility. And I'm going to try not to go into translation theory on here because I'm not an expert as much as I would like to be, but um, I am someone who's passionate about it. But recently, I, I fall into the school personally that believes a translator deserves as much credit as possible. They deserve to own the copyright of their translation. They deserve to be. They deserve to have their name on the cover. And I think that it can be a way to, you know, from a publishing, you know, business standpoint, a good translator can be an extra way to sell the book, right? Um, and so what's interesting is there's a new translation of Kafka's Metamorphosis that just came out, translated by the legendary, amazing Susan Bernofsky, who runs the translation program at Columbia. And on the spine of the Metamorphosis, it's like a really remarkable thing. She says she didn't see it until they just sent her the book. She had no idea it was going to happen. It says, in just bold letters running down the spine, Metamorphosis, Kafka, Bernofsky, and that's it. So she gets equal credit with Kafka on the spine. I've never seen anything like that, and it's really remarkable. Actually, I have seen something like that, which is a different unit, but that's uh, the, the latest Jonathan Franzen book. That was his collection of translations of Carl Krauss's essays. Mm -hmm. That book was written. That book said Jonathan Franzen in huge letters and down at the bottom of the Carl Krauss project. Right, and 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 uh, that book, and even say like Lydia Davis's recent translation of Proust, mm -hmm. those are almost viewed as more than translations. Often they're also they're almost seen as co-creations because people like Davis and Franzen have a recognizable artistic practice that that publishers and readers can sort of latch on to. Um, who are some of your favorite translators, or who are some of the translators that you most admire just as a reader? I don't, man, I don't even know where to begin. Um, there's really too many. So I'll, I guess I'll start from Russian, and also because I work with her, and also because there's a Texas connection. But uh, Marion Schwartz is a translator of Russian to English. She lives in Austin, Texas, has for, I don't know, 40 years. And she's, she's arguably the best Russian to English translator in the world, although, you know, Pivir and Volkonsky are kind of right now the big English language rock star translators. And there's also Robert Chandler, and there's also uh, Arch Tate, and there's also, I mean, there's all sorts of names that, from Russian that translate, but I love Marion's work. She's truly remarkable. Um, she's translated uh, the best Russian novel uh, that I've read since The Master of Margarita. And I read a lot of Russian novels. Uh, it's called Maiden Hair by Mikhail Shishkin, and that book is unbelievable. And the book is complicated, and it is big, it is fat. It's kind of what you want in a Russian book, but it's contemporary. And Marion's translation is amazing, and so I'm lucky enough that I'm publishing a book by Shishkin, a collection of his short stories, and out of the eight stories, Marion has translated four. And it was like, you know, we, we went back and forth a little bit in the editing of those translations, but really, like, she's such a... Titan, and she's been doing it for so long that there's like this much editing. It was just like, oh, Marion, I think you meant to have a comma here, and she's like, oh, you're right. And that's pretty much it. But um, other languages and stuff, I've been, um, I've been really learning a lot about, you know, literature that's not just um, Russian in the last couple of years since I decided to do this. I've been doing my homework, I guess you could say, and um, it's kind of funny to go back and look on my shelf some of my favorite books that I'd never, until I started Deep Vellum, I'd never considered the translator, and now they're some of my favorite translators in the world. Some legends like Michael Henry Heim, who translated from almost every Slavic language, Romanian. Um, the guy was just truly remarkable, and he did a lot for the field of translation studies. But he, the, his most famous translation, um, uh, I do believe, was the, the Unbearable Lightness of Being by Milan Kundera that a lot of people know and love. And um, there's some interesting stories about how Kundra wanted to change that title in English. She thought it sounded too clunky. And uh, Haim was like, no, the title makes the book. You have to keep it. And there's a big argument that went back and forth. And fortunately, he won. And that's now become one of the standard phrases in English. You know, it's like, it's like a, uh, oh, God, what do you call it? A trope now in titles and essays and things. So. Um, do you happen to know what a more literal translation of Kundera's original title would be? Man, I'm going to embarrass myself here. I wish my friend Alex Zucker were watching. He's a fantastic Czech translator. Uh, he lives in New York. He did a recent translation of Joachim Topol's um, uh, novel, and it was 
so good. He's such a good translator. I could ask him, but I'm, I don't know, I'm blanking right now. We'll There's, save that one for the comments later. Yeah, yeah, let's hope. <laughs> uh, but then also, uh, you know, being in Dallas, you wouldn't imagine it being a hotbed of literary translation, but UT Dallas has a really remarkable translation studies program, and one of my favorite professors there is Sean Cotter, who translates from Romanian to English. Um, and so he actually is editing a book about Michael Henry Heim um, that Open Letter Books is putting out this year. And it's, it's like really an amazing thing. Um, a lot of essays about how Heim taught, about his translation theory. And then he also was asked by a Romanian publisher to write his autobiography in Romanian. And so it's now being translated into English for the first time. In Romanian, it was like his eighth language that he learned or something. So he has a he has a reputation and a profile in Romania that he does not have here in the United States. Is that correct? That's correct. How interesting! So they they appreciate his work bringing Romanian literature to a non-Romanian audience. Absolutely. Hmm. Kind of awesome. Yeah, that is pretty amazing. Yeah, there's like in almost every other language group in the world because English is the dominant language. Um, you know, the, these literary authors, some of the most famous authors in each country and language group, um, they do translation, like, on the side. They mm -hmm. write, they translate. It's part of their process because it helps them learn new methods and new techniques. So, I mean, I absolutely believe that translation is an act of creative writing, mm -hmm. uh, or it certainly can be. And so it's this interesting process through which authors gain, you know, a repertoire in their own field through translation, and uh, one of my authors on publishing, Sergio Pitol, is one of Mexico's most famous authors. He's also the most famous off translator in Mexico of Jane Austen, Joseph Conrad, Vitol Gombrovich, a couple Russians. Like he did a lot of like classic American and English literature, and then he also did some Polish and Russian. And so when you you see books in Mexico that have his picture in the corner. Up in the top corner, it says Sergio Pitol translation, and it's like a big deal. You know, it's like, oh, this is, it's kind of like the Lydia Davis thing you're talking about. Because her Swan's Way is completely different than the other six books in the series now. It's like, it just reads completely differently. And of course, if you or I translated Swan's Way, it would be completely different than Lydia Davis's. And so you can learn a lot about, I don't know, world literature through translation, and you can also come to appreciate the translator's task as being something really amazing. And you can start to have favorite translators because they do really remarkable things with language. Like if you compare translations of Garcia Marquez, there have been several different translators who worked with them, so you can go and compare. And that's kind of a fun thing. Edith Grossman and Gregory Obasa, two legends in the field. Both amazing, I must say. Great. Well, all those individuals aside, <laughs> can we say for you, what are the hallmarks of a good translation? What, what do you look for in a particularly good or successful translation? Can you even generalize that much about translation? Um, well, I'm, I'll answer as a reader, um, because I guess as a reader, as a publisher, and then as like a translation theorist, there are all sorts of different answers. And they're all right. It just depends on the situation. Um, you know, there are times when a quote unquote literal translation is what you need, as if such a thing existed. Uh, but in reality, man, I just want to read something that it doesn't necessarily read like a translation, if this makes sense. And there's a big debate about this. It's not necessarily my translation theorist answer, but as a reader, you just want to read, a, you just want to read something cool, right? You want to read something different. You want to read something new. You want to read something that's fun. Maybe you want to escape. Maybe you want to, you just want to read a book or a story or a poem. And that's what's important is just like to get that art, that literary art in front of you. Um, and so just, you can be like, wow, that's a funny word, right? Like, oh, I wonder what that was in Swedish. And then sometimes you can check on the other side of the page and compare. Sometimes you do, you know, you will never know. Um, sometimes it's just kind of to be like, I wonder what the translator was thinking when they translated this weird phrase. But in reality, I just like to read. And I like to read translated literature not because it's translated, but because it's great literature, if that makes sense. But then as a publisher, what makes a good translation is something that's smooth or, even if it's not smooth, if it captures the original. A book can be clunky and weird in the original. I am the type of editor and publisher who believes that it should then be clunky and weird in the English because it can change the way that we view our own language. If we just smooth everything out into perfectly grammatical English, we're not doing anybody any favors. Like, the whole reason we read the world 
is not to read our perception of the world, it's to read their perception of the world. And so that's important to me, like I'm you know, now editing a bunch of novels at once, and it's fun to see the different styles of authors and translators. And one book was really complicated from a, a grammar and a punctuation standpoint because it had a lot of asides and digressions, and it had like 300 characters, and so it just, the point of view shifts every paragraph, and it was hard to keep track of. You know, you could smooth that out, and in times I did just because it would turn into a run-on that just didn't make it make sense. But in reality, I like to keep it complicated. But then as a translation theorist, I'm all about, like, you know, we need to bring elements of the foreign into the English. And so if that's done well, then it goes back to the reader standpoint where it's like, you just want to read something, right? You're not, like, looking to be challenged every step of the way with theory bashing you over the head. You just want to read a cool story or a cool poem or a new point of view. And that's, that's, so there's like three different answers for the three different, you know, ha hats I have to wear at all times. But I think they're all, they're all valid. I hope none of my translator friends take me to task for you. <laughs> maybe, maybe I do. I hope they do. Well, I think what you have to say about the productive estrangement that a translation can provide, you know, sort of vis-a-vis -vis our, our native language is something I've heard a lot of translators talk about. Um, something that they're interested in, one of the reasons why they do the work that they do, that they find it rewarding. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, if you just take like an English example, you wouldn't translate Gertrude Stein into another language and abandon her syntax to make it easier to read in that language, because then you lose the complete point of what Stein is doing. Now, I don't know if her... Uh, variations on English syntax are exactly translatable anyway, but you get the point, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a different discussion, Joe. <laughs> Absolutely, and I mean, these, and like you say, translation theory is a whole other thing. Um, but what's interesting about Dee Bellum and having heard you speak about, you know, what you're trying to do uh, several times now, um, is how much you see this as part of a larger effort to uh, just sort of promote broader understanding all around the world. Um, so maybe you could just talk about um, the larger mission of Deep Vellum in terms of, for lack of a better term, um, interest in global issues generally. Um, sure, that's a that's a big question. So stop me if I digress. But um, you know, there there are people who love to read translated literature because it's a way of traveling without having to leave your house. And then there are people who like to read translated literature because it's a way of um, learning uh, perspectives on geopolitical issues. Um, and then, and neither of those are wrong. They're not right. And like, we all read at different times for different reasons. But like, when we're talking about like actual literature, it's, in, I guess it's like important to distinguish like literature from translated history and nonfiction and academic works and other things, because when it comes to literature, like I don't, I think that there is a tendency to promote like translated literature as a way of like quote unquote building bridges. And I think that that's like that's nice, and I'm guilty of saying it too because it's really the easiest way of talking about what translation is. Because translation can be a really tricky subject. It can be very political. It can be very uh, sensitive to a lot of people. Um, you know, there are a lot of when I travel abroad to international book fairs, I take meetings with a lot of very politically minded organizations that are very well aware of promoting their culture as an important way of gaining standing in the world. And for some countries like Germany, that's they have a lot of resources and they do that and it's whatever, but you go meet with the Catalans and the Basques and other nationalist groups, um, it's a very different thing. They're fighting for their own cultural survival, they're fighting for their you know, their language's survival. That's getting away a little bit from the, the picture, but to come back to like literature, you know, it's just I, I, I've started taking up the, the point, and like, as I'm, you know, you've, you've heard me talk about it a lot. I guess I've been lucky to speak a lot in Dallas about this. We've been on some panels together, literary festivals and things, and the bigger mission is, like, it's not necessarily to build a bridge, but it's to provide more perspective, you know? Um, and that's the most important thing, is the idea that I'm not reading this book from Russia because I want it to say, Putin is bad, or Putin is good. I just want to read a book from Russia to be like, Yo, how do people live in Russia? How do people think in Russia? Um, not necessarily about politics, but like, how do they fall in love? How do they fall out of love? How do writers in Russia describe these processes that I'm experiencing in English? Because 
I read American books right now, and I'm just not identifying with them. But for some reason, I'm reading French books right now, and I'm identifying with them on a hyper level. And that's really interesting. And it's, it's interesting, too, because do I have to identify with characters or just identify with plots or themes or styles? Well, the idea is I'm doing deep vellum so that you can have more options in that, right? Like for people who are interested in experimental literature or for, you know, politically sensitive issues coming out of politically sensitive countries like Russia. You know, there it's just adding more perspective to our understanding of what's going on in the world and more than what's going on, like how people are actually living within what's going on. Like right now there's, uh, you know, I've been following this Gaza story really closely and it's really tragic. Um, and it's, it's breaking my heart, like, every, every time I read the New York Times, and so it's, it's been hard. But one thing that has come out of this has been a, a discussion online about um, Arabic language literature, but Gazan literature in particular. And um, there's a fantastic blog. Anyone who's watching who's not familiar with it, check out ArabLit. I think it's ArabLit.wordpress.com or something like that, but just Google ArabLit. There's a woman who runs that site, and she, she pulls together you know, Arabic literary reviews, she commissions essays, she just, she is the central portal for all things Arabic literature in English. And on there last week, she, she made the note that there's only been one book from Gaza ever translated into English. One. And so, you know, you have this essential country of two million people that has had one book published in English ever. It's one of the most politically sensitive countries on earth. And so, we have no idea what's going on in Gaza if we don't understand how people in Gaza live. Not everyone in Gaza is, you know, Hamas militant. And so it's just, it's, it's really a crime that, you know, we can have such a simplistic understanding. It would also be a crime if I was to take advantage of the situation and sign a book from Gaza and be like, this is the Gaza book, you know, like, this book shows that everybody's not Hamas or anything. It's like, there's no one book that can do that. But, but my interest was peaked, and so I started talking to people and translators being like, what are books from Gaza? Like, what are books from the West Bank? Like, what is going on? Like, I need to expand my horizons of what is possible. And it turns out there are authors who have written books that have gotten great reviews, and they're not political one way or the other. They're just books, you know, and that's an important thing. But if you read them, you gain an understanding on a deeper level of the politics and the situation. Um, and so that's the hope. I signed a similar book from Russia that is from a Muslim province in the south of Russia. It's going to be the first novel ever published from that region, Dagestan. And so it's kind of a big deal because like, it adds new perspective on just like, what is life in Dagestan? How do people in Dagestan think about marriage? How do they think about the Russian government in Moscow? And that's kind of a new, that's going to be a new perspective, and I'm really excited. And so I hope to round that out with more perspectives like that from around the world. But not yeah. every book has to be political. That was, that was really all I was trying to say. Well, sure. I mean, there is a politics to it in that it's easy to ignore the humanity of those people if you don't have a, a representation of it available to you. Yeah. That's and that's one thing that works of literature absolutely provide. And that can be very dangerous mm -hmm. if we have very firm opinions about who's right and who's wrong or who's on this side or who is on that side in terms of a particular issue. Right. I mean, it strikes me that what you say about... Um, what is it like to just live in that culture? I mean, that's one reason why we read books from the past, too, right? There's that wonderful quote from the novel by L.P. Hartley called The Go-Between. I think it's the first line of that novel, which is, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there, right? And literature is one of the few ways that we can access even a, a glimmer of a sense of what it would have been like to live at that particular time. Put place and language aside, even for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, but now we're getting very philosophical. <laughs> uh, but that was wonderful. You're not too, man. You know, like you just want to talk about how awesome books are, but you know. Yeah, well, sure, we could spend hours and hours doing that. Um, but I wanted to give you an opportunity uh, to to talk about the books that you actually have coming out this fall, because Deep Vellum has actually not published anything just yet. Your books are imminent, so I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about the first five titles. I believe is that correct? Sure, yeah. I can talk about five, a hundred titles, yeah. <laughs> the first five that you'll be publishing, and if you want to share an excerpt or a blurb or anything about any one of those titles, or just tell us more about the specific books that we'll be able to purchase from Deep Vellum here in the next few months, 
Yeah. Well, um, I must say, you can go ahead and pre-order the books now on deepvellum.org. So uh, get your butt over there. And if you subscribe before September 1st, or if you donate a certain amount of money, you'll receive recognition in the first book I'm printing, uh, which is called Texas, The Great Theft. Uh, and it's written by Carmen Buyosa, who is, uh, was described by Roberto Bolaño as Mexico's greatest woman author. Um, but she's, she's a really remarkable writer. This will be her fourth novel in English. Uh, and she's written like 15, though. She's won the biggest novel prize you can win in Mexico. She's won prizes all throughout Latin America. She's honored regularly in America at Latino and Hispanic book fairs. Um, but, you know, there just needs to be more attention drawn to her work. And so I'm publishing this book called Texas the Great Theft, and um, I guess I could read an excerpt from it here in a minute. But as you can tell from the title, it is a novel about the Texas-Mexico border written from a Mexican perspective. It takes place in 1859, uh, and it involves all the politics and history that were leading up to 1859 between Texas and Mexico, and life on the Rio Grande, or Rio Bravo, depending on your perspective. And uh, there's um, a, a wealthy Mexican landowner who gets insulted by this new sheriff. In 1859, racial tensions were running high in America. Texas was a slave-owning state. Mexico was not a slave-owning country. There were huge tensions with uh, slaves, runaway slaves crossing the border and all sorts of things with that. Um, but this new sheriff in town insults the Mexican landowner, so he goes back to Mexico, gathers forces, and invades America. And this is based on a true story. And I doubt most Texans have ever heard of it, um, but it's a really unique project. And so she kind of gets in the head of every character in the town at the time. This is the book with 300 characters or so. It's really crazy. But it's, there's, you know, Anglos, there's German socialist immigrants, there's uh, Southern Bells, there's dance hall girls, there's Indians, there's slaves, free, there's free black men, there's, um, you know, bakers and butchers and boatmen, children, getting inside the head of everybody and what's going on there and what this incident meant to them and what, what the tension was like. And so, of course, you read this book. It takes place in 1859. And then you watch the news about the border of Texas and Mexico. It's just as militarized now. It's just as crazy. It's just as tense as it was when this guy invaded in 1859. When Texas, when they were still disputing whether or not Texas owned the land or America owned the land between the Nueces River, which uh, goes to San Antonio, and the Rio Grande, which was all supposed to be Mexican land, um, even after Texas independence. So there was, it's a really interesting book. I think people will gain a lot of, you know, insight. But more than that, it's just a really remarkable book. Like, it's a feat of ingenuity to, to tell the stories of all these different characters. Those are people that people don't write books about. So it's kind of a unique thing. So that book is coming out in October. Um, and uh, the author will be in Dallas and Houston and San Antonio doing readings, and then she'll be going to Austin for some events. Uh, and so that's going to be a lot of fun. It's a full-on Texas book tour, which is going to be nice. For a book called Texas, it's exactly what I could have hoped for. Um, but then uh, I was going to publish a book a month after that, but I got a new distribution deal, which I don't think I'm allowed to announce yet, but it starts in January, so I pushed back the second and third books to January, uh, and it'll be a book a month starting in January. And uh, the second book is by Mikhail Shishkin. It's a collection of his short stories translated by Marion Schwartz and Austin, among others. And he writes some big, fat novels that are about some really heady things. He loves to write about the big issues, you know, love, life, death, resurrection, all those beautiful things. Um, and his stories are actually the, the easiest way to get into his style. They're, they're exactly, they're written very similarly, but in just a much more condensed scale. So I'm hoping that this can be the gateway to Shishkin for a whole new readership in America, because he has two novels that have already come out in English. Um, so it's, uh, it's adding to his oeuvre, and there's, he gets rumored for Nobels every now and again, and so we'll see how that goes. I sure would love to publish a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, and then the third book is by Sergio Pitol. He is uh, one of Mexico's greatest living authors, and he won the Cervantes Prize in 2005, which is like the Spanish language Nobel, and yet he's never had any of his work translated into English. And that was probably because he's not magical realist. And even though he's a, he was a contemporary of Garcia Marquez and Fuentes and Vargas Llosa, he didn't write 
in an identifiable style. And while those guys were living in Latin America and becoming very famous during the boom, Pitol was actually a cultural attaché in the Mexican embassy in Warsaw, Beijing, Moscow, Prague. He was a lot, spending a lot of time in Eastern Europe and communist countries in a time when that was politically sensitive. But uh, he was not communist, and he wrote works that are kind of like Borges. They take place in this world that is real, but it's not any one thing. You don't read Borges's, you know, uh, ficciones and say, oh yeah, this is all in Argentina. It takes place in this mythical realm of human existence. And Pitol's stories are like that, too. I'm publishing this trilogy of memory that he wrote, and it's a, they're essentially literary memoirs, but they're completely, you, I cannot tell you, and I don't think anyone can tell you, hopefully scholars will, uh, where the line between fiction and fact in these stories lies. But it's not fiction and fact like, oh, he's just embellishing his own history. It becomes magical, not magical realism kind of way, magical in the Borges way, where it's like, this is, this is outside of the realm of what we've ever considered literature's possibilities. And so it's really remarkable stuff. So I'm publishing the first book in that trilogy in February, and the second book in July or June, and then the third book will come out in early 2016. And so when that trilogy was published, that's what won him the Cervantes Prize. So after the trilogy comes out, I'm going to start publishing some of his novels because they've never been published in English, and they're really, um, they've influenced the current generation of Spanish language writers around the world. They grew up reading him. He's mandatory reading in high school. He's the kind of writer that um, one young Mexican woman writer, Valeria Luiselli, she described reading his books for the first time as a teenager and not knowing where he's from. His name doesn't sound Mexican. His books are all called funny titles that are not Mexican titles. And so she read the book and was like, who is this guy? It takes place in like Germany in the 1800s. It was a story collection I hope to publish called Mephisto's Waltz. And again, he's dealing with the themes of like big literature, international literature. He's the kind of guy who'll quote Bakhtin in conversation regularly. So he's really remarkable. It's like, it's an honor to get to publish him. Uh, and so I'm following that up with an experimental novel called Sphinx uh, by Anne Garetta, who is uh, a member of the UNIPO, um, which is the French experimental writing group that George Perec and Italo Calvino and Raymond Cano were members of. And she was one of the first women to join the group back in 2000. Um, she was also one of the youngest members to join back then. But she's never had any of her work translated into English. And even after I signed this novel, I didn't realize it at the time, this will be the first work by a female member of the Ulipo ever translated into English. Ever. Like, that's just crazy. She's not the first member of those females. She's not the last. And yet this will be the first work. So something important to me with Deep Vellum is that I want to publish men and women authors in equal numbers and try and draw attention to that. Fortunately, there's been a lot of discussion about that, trying to draw attention to the need to read more women authors, because if you don't think about it, it will just go that, oh, I published 10 men this year, one woman. And that's just not, that's not right, and it's not the way it should be. And so trying to you know, force myself into reading the world and seeing what's going on between men and women authors alike, and there's really some amazing stuff. So that aside... Um, Anne Goretta's book is amazing. She well, we seem to have lost Will there momentarily. Uh, let's hope that he is able to get back on line here in just a moment. Hey, sorry about that. Oh, well, it's okay. I don't even know what I did. It's it's not a it's not a Google Hangout with at least one sort of technical glitch like that. Cool. <laughs> I, I honestly I just touched my keyboard and it disappeared, so I'm just not gonna touch it anymore. Um. Anyways, I was talking about Angaret. Awesome. <laughs> so Angaret is. <laughs> no, you don't have to do it. <laughs> But uh, Angreta Sphinx is amazing. She got invited to the Alipo because of this book. But it was, uh, it's a love story written without any gender markers between the two characters in love. And it's something that's never been done before or since in the French language. It's really, it was also, a, it's a landmark. It's going to be a big deal when it comes out because this book actually fills a, a void 
like a gaping void in the understanding of the lesbian or gay novel as well as like the feminist novel. Like this book is in dialogue with some serious stuff uh, and some some serious novels that gained popularity in the 80s and 90s, and it's a it's a crime that it was never published in English before. So I'm really looking forward to publishing this book and uh, getting it out there. So it's all, what's funny is it's also the book my mom is uh, looking forward to reading out of all my books the most because it's a love story that takes place in Paris in the 80s. So it's like yeah, it's you know involving cabaret dancers and it's involving some sexy nights on the Seine and a murder, and so it's a story that's uh, you can read on one level as just a love story that involves some sex and some crime. And then you can read it on another level, and another level, and another level, and another level. And that is what all good books should be. And this is, it's just like, I, I started Deep Vellum with the mission to publish books exactly like this. Like books that are, that deserve to be in English, and that never have been for whatever reason. And so, I'm, I'm like really excited about this book, and I actually just found out today, I'm getting the translation of it next week, so I'm like, so excited to read that, uh, the whole thing. So, um, And then I, the fifth book on the first list is coming out in May. Um, and, well, the first list, by the way, has changed. You know, it was originally the first five books. Then I got this new distributor, and it's kind of changed everything. So my first list is now, like, seven books. But um, one of them is the Sergio Patel book. One of them is the second book in that trilogy. And another one is that book by the woman from Dagestan I mentioned already. But then the fifth book is by Jon Gunnar, the former mayor of Reykjavik, Iceland. And I signed a trilogy of his, like, childhood memoirs. And there are these literary memoirs, or autobiographical fiction, whatever you want to call it. It's like, I don't know, they sell it as memoir or novel, depending on who's reading it and who wants to read it So in Iceland. So I'm going to do the same thing in America. But this guy, Jon Gunnar, is really amazing. He was a punk rocker, comedian, musician. Uh, very famous guy in Iceland, probably the most famous comedic actor in Iceland. Uh, his wife is Bjork's best friend, and he, in 2009, after the global crisis, uh, destroyed Iceland's economy. He and some friends formed a joke political party called the Best Party, and he ran for mayor. His friends ran for other seats, and they all won. He won the mayorship. His friends were on city council and in parliament, and he served as mayor for four years. His term just ended a couple months, like two months ago. And so he was a, a really remarkable person. I learned about him when he ran for mayor four years ago. But it wasn't until fall of 2013, I was in Frankfurt at the book fair there, and learned that he was a writer as well, and he had written these memoirs. And I said, well, why aren't they in English? And the publisher, the foreign Icelandic publisher said, we're kind of just waiting for the right guy to come along and ask. And I was like, can I be that guy? Because I love this guy. I love Jon Gunnar. Like, he's an inspiration to me personally. But then also, I know I'm not the only person. He has 100,000 Facebook friends and, you know, 15,000 Twitter followers. And he does speaking engagements with Penn International and Amnesty International. And he's a really remarkable guy in general. And so I signed on this trilogy of memoirs that he's written about his childhood. And so what was kind of cool about that is, like, right when I did that, uh, the publisher Melville House in New York signed on Gennar's nonfiction. So we kind of have like an interesting thing going where like there's this literary output and this nonfiction output and these two different publishers, Melville House being one of my favorite publishers there is. And so it's like it's like a real honor to work with Gennar and it's also going to be a lot of fun because he's coming to Texas uh, next year and he's going to be spending a lot of time in Houston and Dallas and Austin. He's doing a comedy festival in Austin in three weeks. So I'm going down to hang out with him there. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Like it's a really good list of books. I'm like... I am honored and blessed and so excited to work with these guys and girls. Yes, and I'm excited as well. I actually have a subscription, uh, and I encourage well. everyone to consider doing that. It's going to be the best way to get your hands on these titles, whatever five they may be. <laughs> True. Um, and whenever they're available. I know I'm particularly uh, interested uh, uh, in Sphinx, the Anna Anna? Anna Garrett? Anna. And oh, so I'm, I'm, and I agree with you. That's a, a very, very important book, uh, particularly um, right now, in terms of um, our understanding of the Ulipo, which its influence seems to grow with each passing season. Mm -hmm. and more people in English are 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 interested in what they what they've been doing. Sure, but uh, it looks like we're out of time. I'm afraid. Um, 
Any one last thing you want to share with us before uh, we say our goodbyes and thank yous to the people who make these programs possible? Um, nothing, nothing in particular I'd like to say except um, thank you to the translators for making it all possible. And um, if anyone out there is watching and is interested in becoming more involved with Deep Vellum, um, you know, you can subscribe, you can donate at deepvellum.org. If you're interested in serving on the board, if you want to be more involved and help volunteer to help set up events for Deep Vellum authors as well as other authors from all over the world, then please write in um, deepvellum at gmail.com. And then also uh, just keep, keep an eye on the website because we have a lot of really cool events coming on in Dallas, um, but all over the world. And um, I'm really excited to get these books launched. And I don't know, more big announcements will be coming soon, I hope. And hopefully I'll be hiring someone to help me out full time with this because uh, it's not a one-man job anymore. But I have a bunch of great people who are freelancing help and, uh, and it includes the book designer and the marketing, marketing guy. Um, and other PR help as well as people who are editing. It's just it's a really remarkable process and it's it's been a lot of fun because I've been meeting really cool people this way and everyone in Dallas has been very helpful and everyone uh, in New York and abroad. It's just the response has been overwhelming and so it's really cool to have the chance to talk uh, like this. And so hopefully we get to do it again in like five years. I think that was one question that we didn't get to cover. Like what, what do I see in five years? Well, I hope I'm a big deal and I don't have time for this. I'm just kidding. I'm yeah, that very well may be the case. Well, I hope you interview me in five years and you're like, wow, what, what's changed? And I'm like, well, man, like I, I hit all my goals. Like I'm an, an arts organization embedded in Dallas that is, has made it a more literary city and helped, you know, further the missions of the other literary organizations here while, you know, promoting more readership in Dallas for great books and from all over the world. Because it's not just about translated literature. It's about getting translated literature included in the conversation of literature, and then promoting literature in general, getting people to stop reading garbage. So that's important to me, too. It's part of the mission. And um, so I really just like, Deep Vellum has a really good mission, and I really believe in it. And um, the people I've met who believe in it are really helping. And I think that we have, we're making the steps. And so in five years, I'd like to see the mission really at a point where I can like look around and see how it's impacted life in Dallas and in Texas and beyond. And um, so that's that's kind of where I see it. I don't envision getting rich, but I do hope that I publish some really amazing books. Um, I hope I make a living, and I hope my authors can start to find readership in English that they, you know, obviously never had before. And um, you know, there's there's so many good books out there. Like it just I stay up at night and just like, how could I publish all of the books? So uh, even if I can't do it, I hope other people start to you know feel inspired too. And wherever they live, hopefully not New York, they go. I want to start a publishing house too, and then they get it going and publish some great stuff. That's that. That's where I hope to see this. And so that would be my closing words. And thank you for your time and the interview. This is a lot of fun. Well, always a pleasure to talk with you, Will. Thanks so much for sharing your enthusiasm for translated literature and just lots of wonderful insights and information about what you're doing here. I don't think there's anybody in Dallas who's ever done quite what you're trying to do. Um, Certainly not anybody doing it right now other than yourself. So we're very glad to have you here. I um, want to thank everyone for tubing in, tuning in. I don't know, whatever. Uh, one of the questions or comments we had was, uh, it's not a hangout. It's not a hangout without a hangout, which is very true. Very true. Well, we got a comment. I mean, someone is watching. So I really appreciate that. Um, but thank you all for, uh, for your time. And I also just want to say, Thanks to the National Endowment of the Arts, the City of Dallas Office of Cultural Affairs, the Texas Commission on the Arts, Heritage Auctions here in Dallas, and of course all of the individuals, uh, individual members and supporters of the Writers Garrett. Uh, without those people, programs like this would not be possible. Uh, we hope to have another chat here in a couple of weeks, so stay tuned, uh, or tubed, whichever one, uh, for more information. And we hope to see you all again very soon. Thanks again, Will. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.